document and make any notes you think are interesting. And right now it just has some challenges that we'll get to later. And uh, oh, great. Let's see, you can see people just signed in. There you guys are. If you want to add your name, that's good. We, know, we can know who everyone is. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to have this, the structure of the workshop is basically going to be 45 minutes of uh, kind of talking. Chris and I have been spending a lot of time collecting examples that we're really excited about and that we think are really interesting and inspirational. Um, and we want to share that with you guys and create some kind of uh, ideas and discussion about those. And then we're going to give you some challenges. And that's what's going to drive the hacking. Um, It'll take a little bit to explain kind of what we have here and some of the ideas we've been thinking about and like some things you guys can work on. And then from there, we'll spend an hour uh, just building stuff. And hopefully we can have everyone working on different things, um, whatever whatever you're excited about working on from that list. Yeah. Uh, so, any questions? <laughs> Wait, is there power? Ah. Uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of plugs on the other side. Okay, unfortunately, you might have to move up there. Yeah, we'll, we'll be fast. <laughs> uh, so, uh, shall, shall we get started? <laughs> this is our intro to the optics of camera hacking. <laughs> this is an amazing picture that Chris found. We're going to share actually all of these images and files that we, uh, <laughs> all of these images and files that we're showing tonight. Um, we're going to provide a download when we're done. It'll be in a link on this page. Um, and as you guys are working at the end of the day, we hope that you can have links to stuff that uh, you've done on this page. Uh, so we'll try and document things that people are working on, but you also need to do some self-documentation so that we can collect what everyone's done. Um, great, yeah, so we're going to start with uh, the prospects of measuring the body. Go ahead, take it away, Chris. Okay, so we're going to start with um, Ray, who actually invented the camera and um, started trying, trying to sort of like use the camera use like, try to create an instrument basically to, to understand motion and to understand locomotion, especially like uh, funded by the military, try to basically optimize, um, find like optimal way like of walking for a soldier. And, and he did a lot of studies um, on um, human locomotion and like animal locomotion and, 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 and and that, that gun was actually one of the first cameras, that diagram that you saw. It yeah. wasn't just like a gun camera, it was one of the first cameras. So all about quantification of like, um, there's a couple of studies of like how to, the earlier one that we've seen here, these are devices to understand like how, um, how horses run and the, the whole question, are they actually at some point um, in the air or not? There was like a whole discussion on like how, and this is like a quantification for like, understanding like pigeon flight and making this amazing like mechanics that sort of like pick up like um apparently pick up from from the bird's um, wing and like sort of visualize on a on a chronograph um, on a gra graphically visualize um, um these motions and then oh, so trying to actually this is like sort of like these these, these setups this is for for um one of these setups that are, that has been designed by Murray, and and it's it's all sort of done from scratch and, and very scientific scientific setups. Um, and about the same time, I mean, um, Muybridge in San Francisco had started like doing these studies, almost like maybe even a little bit less. Like there is always this question: who was first, and who invented the camera first, and who invented the methodology first, and like. There's like it's different. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but um, but they're, they're both kind of working at the same time. But yeah. the, the interesting thing is that Moebridge was really focused on uh, like just the motion of humans from a, a little more kind of more purist perspective, while as Mari was kind of like you said working working with soldiers and trying to analyze things for like efficiency and uh, so there's some different motivations behind what they were doing. And um, interesting, well, here are some of the camera setups explained. Um, some of these like triggers are like done with like small little trip wires, and, and there's always like a grid in the background, and sort of like really some sort of like 
um, like I mean, the, 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 the the system, like how to how to how to sort of like understand this is very interesting. And these, the, there's like a whole like this is a film. So that's actually like it's like 90 minutes, but it's a whole documentary about like how how it's been like setting up these these studies and like. Yeah, and like using grids in the background for measurement and using multiple cameras that are spaced different amounts and yeah. Yeah, so and um, I love the Moigra stuff because it's always people doing ridiculous things and you're just kind of supposed to take it as a matter of fact. Like this one, he, if you look really closely you can see that the, the shorts are actually drawn in. Someone penciled <laughs> them in. <laughs> I think Moigra really likes taking pictures of naked people. So there's kind of a modern corollary of these, which is uh, it keeps showing up. This this idea of like bullet time or people being still or capturing something that is a fleeting moment and uh, saving it. So this project Trampolina was from a Dutch um, Dutch collective. Uh, they used something like 36 cameras, like point and shoot cameras, all hooked up by USB to one computer, and you jump on a trampoline. And when you reach the height of the trampoline jump. Uh, it takes a picture with all of the cameras simultaneously, and uh, uh, you have this moment of like you being at the apex of your jump, just like that Moonbridge uh, picture. But this is like the 2010 version. There's uh, another project from a uh, group Multitouch Barcelona um, that was exhibited last year, kind of a simpler version, just a single camera, but also about this kind of apex of your jump. And they took multiple shots, one for each time you reached your apex and uh, made a little animated GIF out of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think this is kind of a meme, that idea of like floating around. Um, yeah. So um, these studies led to sort of like, I mean, initially the funding, if you look at the funding and the, the military was interested in like basically like doing these, these studies and like funded like people like Murray. Um, to to do the, the optimal soldier walk and then like um, a little bit later in like 19, 1910 or so like the Gilbreth in in the US did um, did really focus on like the ergonomics of things and like trying to like do find design techniques to understand um, how you can quantify it or like or sort of sort of also really understand like motion but in, in terms of like Production and like sort of show the pictures first. Maybe yeah, maybe we'll like, yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, we we we. So um, this is um, this is like box stacking in the post office and like um, so the, the the person has like a, a, an array of like lights on on his um, on his arm to the to the basically to the toe and and in in, like, in long term exposure you can see like the, the path he's he's taking and like how basically trying to understand like how what's an optimal way of like stacking stacking boxes in a in a post office and then this is uh, in an assembly line and there's always like this quantification with the clocks and 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 and, and basically like um, a, a pull slide on the on the fingers and here this is like um uh, assembly and so this is another assembly. There's assembly for and, and really, really trying to uh, sort of de design the most and, and find the sort of like on looking for the the most graceful motion for like a certain task and most efficient. This is like sort of like Gilbert um, um, re reenacted. This is um, this is uh, actually a robot. Um, with the same sort of like technique, but like you can see robot motion in comparison, and this is robot motion in comparison. And you also have the the Roomba. The Roomba, yeah, the Roomba. Has everyone seen these pictures of Roombas leaving light trails? So Roombas like clean clean rooms in this very interesting algorithmic fashion. And uh, if you want to understand the algorithm, you can kind of stare at them for a long time. But you can also just take a long exposure photo that uses uh, an LED like on the Roomba and tracks the LED. So like this is one Roomba just going around a room over an hour or something like that. And you can see it makes all these funny decisions about like where to turn and it spins in place. 
and uh, decisions about like when it hits a corner to bounce off or to, yeah. And there's some, we couldn't find it, but there's some different algorithms for different Roombas, and you can see like sometimes they go kind of randomly and they look really ineffective, and then sometimes they go kind of like in a, like only clockwise and slowly kind of find all of the contours and edges of the room. And so, yeah, you can kind of plot, plot their trail the same way that the Gilbreths were doing with the human motion. And the Gilbreths also, okay, this is the psychograph, the, the idea of like pulsing the light and understanding and they're demoing it here. Like, yeah, because if, yeah, if you just see the trail, you don't really know like how fast or slow something is going. But if you have, if you have uh, something like this, you can see the lights flashing and it has little bursts of light. Um, and if, uh, if that line is short, then it means someone's moving slowly. If it's long, it means someone's moving faster. So that can give you extra information about uh, the motion over time. It's kind of like a really uh, early version of the sort of statistical computer vision analysis that we're applying to uh, like real-time video now, but they had to do it with a single photo. And this is like a simple trading task. And they basically, um, there's later on, oh yeah, they make also these, um, Check this out. <laughs> these uh, models made from, from, from the studies and I like, try to like sort of, <laughs> this is the same study we've seen earlier, but like kind of like trying to redesign either the tool or yeah, sort of like really study, like reverse engineer and like reverse engineer. And it's tracing it over time, like he's like, and they have all these models. So these are like little snapshots of people doing different jobs. Just yeah, just for people, just yeah, so I can yeah, yeah, make yeah. yourself at home wherever. I just don't sit directly in front of the projector. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. And there's even this is here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. So, what's the, what's the next one? Uh, is, is this part of the same thing? Yeah. 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 So, so besides just using cameras, besides using just cameras to take uh, traces of people moving or robots moving or whatever, you can uh, also look for things that are kind of left over, things that are naturally occurring. Um, so, normally with like the Gilbreth stuff or with Moorbridge, there was something added to the scene. There was a grid or there was an LED. But uh, you can also take a thermal camera and look at an ATM keypad after someone uses it and figure out, oh, these are the four digits that they pressed. And actually, you can see even the, the one in the middle is maybe the, or maybe the one in the middle bottom is like the, the largest dot. That was probably the last one that they pressed. And the one at the middle left is maybe the smallest dot. So that was probably the first one they pressed. And from there, you've only got like three or four combinations left to know what their what their pin number is. Um, How much money do you make? I have to buy a thermal camera first, and that's you know has kind of high, high entry costs. So I haven't quite. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this this one you can't really see it on this screen, but it's a bunch of I think these were iPads or some kind of tablet, and uh, there were kind of remnants of people using it and swiping different gestures, either playing games or reading email or something like that. And uh, each each kind of usage leads to a different. I don't know. It's it's a little bit like a corollary of desire paths. This idea of like um, paths emerging and traces emerging just from repeated use of something. Um, and like I said, there's nothing added to the system. There's no extra grid or LED or anything. It's just trying to extract information uh, from something that's left over. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about changing perspectives. The idea of like normally a camera is held like this. What if we put it somewhere else? So this, no, I told you, might be the best introduction. This is great. Oh, yeah. Wait, <laughs> wrong, wrong music. <laughs> so he's basically carrying the camera on on the stick and sort of like trying to. So with all these perspectives, you can simulate like you are. So good. <laughs> 
So that's that's what he's in for. <laughs> Do you need power first? No, I'm just thinking to turn this on. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I can get the overhead. Okay, right. Yeah. So that was a simple, like, point of view experiment. Um, okay. Um, and then we have. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Um, but also, I, before we mention this, you should go to Tony Hill's website, and there's a there's a link right here. Uh, yeah, TonyHillFilms.com. He has a ton of amazing films. I mean, the putting something on the end of a stick is like a good start, but he's doing things like using these kind of reflective domes, taking 360 video, like really exploring what it means to change the perspective of the camera during photography and video, and how that influences the way that we understand our space. Uh, so definitely check out check out his videos if you want to if, if you want an idea of like what can I do without really hacking a camera just by moving it around like he pretty much answers that question yeah great um, all right and um, so this is this is work by um, Alphonse Schelling who did like I think I was in the 60s in the 60s like try more recent I think more recent. Yeah, he created devices to um, change the view as well. This is like a low resolution picture, but all sorts of like different, this is like super 3D vision with, with like... Um, These are all analog systems. So yeah. this is like mirrors and sometimes lenses and, uh, you know, wood. <laughs> yeah, and this is for like really sort of like focusing on one point on the horizon. Also sort of limiting yourself, like also finding like a physical limitation, creating a physical limitation and... And, and this, this is my favorite. This is, the, this is a camera obscura suit. So if you stand inside this suit, then, you, then you're then you inside the camera obscura and you can walk around and like see the world through a camera obscura. So it's kind of like being able to see with your eyes normally, except you have something in front of you. <laughs> that is your seeing apparatus. Um, we have an idea that's like an extension of this that we're going to give out as a challenge, and uh, we'll get to that later. Where should we? And and um, oh, this this is a really great project from Kiss uh, from Chris and Kenichi. Um, basically, oh maybe I should show these ones first, but uh, sort of inspired by Alphonse Schilling. Oh, like trying to create like a device that allows you to feel really tiny and this is the experiment like hooking up to a microscope with like 50 times vision to a stick and then like creating a little helmet that um, that sort of like so you can like the idea was really how can you create, create a device to feel like really small and and this is um, this is one of the one of the devices, the um, ant device, so you can see through your hands, and basically, like you, 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 um, you can perceive like all the tiny, tiny, tiny things and, and cracks and on on the surface. So it's like um, basically it's just microscopes, but microscopes in your hand, and sort of creating, cre trying to create the experience of feeling really tiny. And then we came along. Maybe that's something you can talk about. This is there's been a lot of research on this actually, and for maybe. Uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, this was a, just this a few months ago. Um, it's a, the idea of like modifying your body image. It's uh, something that people first started exploring uh, for people who have uh, phantom limbs. So there's a problem where uh, if you lose a limb, then sometimes you still feel like you have a limb, even though it's not there anymore, and your brain like refuses to accept it. Um, and you can have pain in this phantom limb, and it's a real like serious problem for these people because they constantly have pain and they can't do anything about it because there's nothing there. Um, so uh, some researchers started experimenting with like getting them to look at uh, someone else's arm and try and associate it with their arm uh, and kind of modify the body image and then eventually like let's say someone's feeling pain because their virtual their phantom limb is like twisted up like this then they will show them someone else's limb twisted up like this and then slowly kind of get the person to do this and if they've associated with that limb, then they can kind of mentally unstretch their phantom limb, and it actually solves this chronic pain problem that they've been dealing with. Um, so this is an extension of that kind of research. Um, you can see at the top left, there's a guy laying on a bed, 
um, and at the uh, just next to him, there's uh, two cameras that are looking down the body of this doll that is wearing also jeans and socks. Uh, but the doll's obviously smaller than the guy, and uh, there's a researcher that's kind of poking both of them with sticks. Uh, and uh, it's a similar stick poking both, of, po poking both the doll and the guy, and the guy is seeing through these cameras. Um, and as you have that feeling and see the action, your brain starts to associate actually with what you're seeing um, really quickly. Um, you totally forget about the fact that it's not really your body and your brain just tells you, oh yeah, of course that's my body. Um, and they found that you start to make uh, incorrect judgments about how, th how far away things are. So once you're feeling associated with this body, you start saying that things are further away than they actually are. Uh, you say that the desk is further away, that it's bigger than it actually is, etc. And if you associate with another body, like these really big legs in panel B, then everything seems really small. You say everything is closer than it actually is, and, um, and so this is really not this is like not a complicated project. It just requires you to hook up cameras and make some fake legs. <laughs> so uh, this would be a fun thing to see people try here. Um, yeah, and I will, I will link to the um, research where they're doing that. Um, all right, and then, okay, that's very closely related to um, the avatar machine, which is uh, basically like the device that sort of like also like things of like the out of body experience. Um, a camera right here that looks at yourself with like a um, very wide angle lens that has a mirror in here, but basically you see in virtual reality glasses yourself as an avatar in real world and 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 that's also sort of like an out-of-body experience there's like um, the, um, and, and, and sort of like taking it like sort of connecting it to like like sort of like the experience of being in a, in a, in a, in a game um, but taking it to the real world um, which one should be okay? Maybe child presents? Yeah. So, so continuing with the theme of getting people to wear ridiculous looking apparatus. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but like, but the, the idea of like, how can you, how can you create the experience of like being a dog, especially when you like, uh, human. You, you're human, but you can't like you can't take your dog for a walk anymore. And you're like at some point, like I don't know, like the you take sort of like uh, creating creating these type of experiences and, and virtual experiences. Um, and also, this is one that's um, sort of like creating the experience, um, sort of like projecting the experience of being someone else. And like and 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 this one is the experience of becoming someone's avatar. And, and there's a lot of things to play with, like with projecting the face and like taking the camera and like sort of replacing things and like sort of the, sort of taking the virtual world and connecting that to the real world. I, I think one of the main things to remember from these projects is that uh, a bunch of these projects we just showed you are really engaging and all they're doing is changing the site of the camera uh, placement and the site of the photo or video exhibition. Um, they're just uh, you know, moving it from where you would normally associate those things, like where they're supposed to be. They're just switching them around or inverting them or moving them really far or making one big and one small. Um, so if you just think about interesting places to put in, uh, interesting places to put photos and interesting places to take photos, uh, you can find a lot of interesting uh, projects. So this is... Um so Kenichi Okada um, like did this experiment to basically try to rig to like sort of like try to hack um, hack London Bridge and like use architecture to like create experiences that you would never like be able to see otherwise. Sort of like how can you sort of like the idea started off with like how can you not to feel really tiny but how can you feel really tall and like use existing structures to create create an optical illusion that you are uh, um, growing into a giant. So um, what you see here is basically just like two, two cameras attached to like the sides of one bridge that open when there's a ship. 
there, and of course there's like a ship schedule and everything's kind of predictable. So um, the camera is just clamped down there, you see the clamp on the bridge. And um, so that thing is going up. And, and while it's going up, like the, the, basically the cameras are going further and further apart. And when you like look at this, like here you can't really see it, but if you look at this in like a, um, a VR glasses, so like the, then um, you can at some point see, okay, you get like a super 3D vision and then the super 3D vision gets more extreme. And at some point, the 3D vision just breaks and you are, like there's a certain limit of like your eyes being able to process the perspectives and then it just becomes one perspective with that left or, or right eye <coughs> that you're looking at. <coughs> sort of like, but what really the interesting bit is like how can you... Yeah, how can you integrate your hardware with the architecture of the city? Uh, yeah, how can, how can you embed your hardware into the city? How can you offload your work onto the architecture? <laughs> We're always doing it the other way, right? We're working to make the architecture. How can we make the architecture work for us? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, where should we start there? Um, maybe the, the, so we were like thinking of constraints and like how can you like really, it's like, it's like hacking the camera. It's like, there's like, okay, there's a good way to start with like thinking about how optics work and how, how these things actually function, but then really like how you, how you create like, um, like a, a sort of like a system, and 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 then like seeing like seeing opportunities for systems yeah. that really are interesting observations. That's that's really a, that's like even more of a challenge. So yeah. this this is like a this this section is a question of what do you what are you taking pictures of? What's your subject, and uh, what event are you using to trigger the camera? Um, normally there's a there's a button on the camera, and someone makes a decision every time they take a picture. But if you have an automated system or you decide in advance what kind of photos you want to take, um, it can lead to really interesting sets of images. I think it's that guy. I want to move it. Okay, maybe not. Um, so um, this is uh, a series by uh, Weston Lundgren and some London photographers. And I found that particularly interesting because they sort of like decided to, I think they did a residency in Beijing, and then they decided to, okay, we're just going to like put out like a bottle and the bottle gonna be our trigger. So when we want to find out like who is who, who are the bottle collectors and who is picking picking these things and like who is who is um, who because there's like yeah there's a, there's like these things happen in New York too. There's a whole economy like if you if you don't speak English and like you don't have visa then I mean that's like always like something you can do to survive. Collect bottles. And and but uh, this is where basically like a trigger system. They on purp purposely like place these bottles and try to reveal like who 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 are these people that actually like look for this. And um, I, I like this one because there's no technology involved. It's just someone making a decision, and in advance they said, "Here's my sensor. My sensor is the bottle." <laughs> and when someone moves it, then I'm going to be the computer vision system that says. You know, sensor has been activated and takes the picture. And there is okay, this one. It's the same with this project. Uh, this this was called uh, Turnstiles, I think. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Bill right Sullivan. Bill, Bill Sullivan. And uh, he, this is here in New York City, and he just kind of camped on one side of the turnstile and took a picture every time someone came through. And you have this really great portrait of New York of people kind of dealing with this space the space between the turnstile sides. Everyone has to deal with the same space. They have to walk through it. They have to figure out how they're going to maneuver through it. People that are big, people that are small, people that are carrying things, and they all respond differently. Um, so it's nice to see them all side by side. I think with uh, Bill Sullivan's project, one of the important things is that he exhibited the photos uh, like all side by side, and you can see and you can make visual comparisons between them. Yeah, this this is the same same idea. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know about this. Yes, 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 yes. That's a German photographer, and he's like um, actually then also interested in like sort of like creating like connecting these type of perspectives with each other. This is like just called Ministry. There's like he made like a series about this art school, just like like. Um, 
documenting the floor of the art school and like just like using and this is like it's it's a, it's um, um, a ministry in like Germany and like sort of like documenting all the floor. It's almost like street view, but for the whole place. But um, um, sort of yeah. Um, Squirrels. Squirrels. <laughs> okay, we can yeah. do that this, one. This is an, this, so this is an automated photo trap instead of just a decision. This was something that Chris built uh, with it with an intern. Um, yeah, this is an experiment. The, the trap is actually over there, and we can like if you brought a camera, like we can sort of like also external like the trigger for other things. So like this is the experiment basically here is to try to create like. Um, uh, a photo trap to to um, take pictures of like the squirrel population and um, do um, sort of these type of study in like Tompkins Park. It's it's um, it's basically uh, like a, a food food container and like a, a basic like basic mechanical trigger to 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 shoot a photo every time like a squirrel hops on there and like takes takes one of the nuts. Um, and um, then these, where should we start with these guys? So, um, show, show, I show, show to Nolz's first, I think. Okay. Um, um, so this is, a, this is a kind of meme when it comes to time-lapse photography. It's putting a camera in a box and sending it somewhere in the mail. Uh, this has been done a bunch of times. Uh, I like Tim Knowles' version because it looks like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how he exhibits it. Uh, so it, inside the package, he wrote something about some things about the project that explains what's happening. Um, and uh, I think it's just a normal camera that he hacked with uh, to have extra batteries and yeah, not nothing nothing too special here. And he shipped it from one place to another and exhibits the video. And it's really interesting to see the way that the package travels. Um, you, have, you have your video, right? Can you yeah, I have that one. This, this is like scene. something that's actually this camera here um, that you see here. It's like two of them on each side of the package. Um, and I sent it to my collaborator, Kenichi, in Tokyo. Um, and. Um, I think I took his camera and then I sort of decided to send it back this way, <laughs> so facing outward. And then you can see here, it's like it shuts off when there's no signal, but it's like this is like in Japan already. Like you can see like the workers there, like on the other side of the case. But you could uh, potentially put like GPS tracker and everything in it, and like sort of like sort of. But the idea is like, how can you use? Uh, how, yeah, revealing like. Um, you don't like. No one really knows the, the the path that the camera travels, or the, no one knows the path that the package travels until you put a camera inside the box. No one knows the time that's passing until it happens to be pointed at the at the clock. So it's interesting to stick something inside a box like that and start taking records and doing the same kind of measurement that Muybridge was doing or that Murray was doing, but of maybe a larger scale phenomenon. And I was surprised because no one like I actually wrote on the. I should have taken a picture of the. Customs decoration form, but I, <laughs> I, I, I I did it correctly, and I was like, you know, I was like, um, yeah, I was basically like declaring, and maybe it's here. Well, I don't know if you can see that, but on on, on here it's basically written like it's declared like two time lapse cameras. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. What else do we have? Uh, Baba, I guess. This is like another like package camera. This is a, um, a friend of mine in London. Um, who he did something that he basically also tried to do um, to disguise like the camera. And this is like one of these like old like really flat ones with the strange cartridges, like a white blender. These these cameras that actually you like wind up by like squeezing them. Um, and and what he did is basically he externalized the trigger like this is the trigger and he's like taking pictures of um, the inside of like London like try to like put it in the in the patch slot and like taking pictures and doing records of like the the, 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 the entrance area of like London flats mm. and sort of like you are in 
And, and then the interesting bit is there, like you can take like pictures of like private space, but like, and that's really the question, like what, where's the legal boundaries of how far can you go with like, 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 yeah, because this is sort of like, this is supposed to be a hack to like get into private space, but not violating like the law right. by doing it. So it's like, so I think that's an interesting approach too. Let's, let's talk about that more for a second. Yeah. Um, the, we got here. Yeah, let's talk about that more. So uh, this was a project I did uh, a few months ago called People Staring at Computers. Um, <laughs> this, uh, did anybody recognize where this is? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is at two of the Apple stores here in Manhattan. Um, and uh, mm, a Apple wasn't really happy about this project. So they they sent the Secret Service to my house and took uh, took my computers at 7 a.m. in the morning what? and um, uh, so it, uh, yeah <laughs> but I, I really like these these expressions it was a photography project I did um, like I said maybe four months ago and I would I wanted to go out and collect a bunch of images of people as they're using their computers um, because I was really interested in this expression that comes on our face when we're using. Uh, the internet, especially, we're, we're interacting with other people very often. We're, um, you know, it's talking on Skype or uh, using Facebook or whatever. Um, but the expression on our face says nothing about the fact that we're interacting with other people. Um, we're kind of depersonalizing everyone because it's happening on a screen. Um, so I wanted, I saw this in myself. I was doing time lapse of myself first to see if, you know, to see how this happened. And I wanted to collect some images of other people. So I decided. It, it, I'm kind of against the idea of like viruses, so I thought I would have to find some public space that had, had computers that I could access, and the Apple Store is the perfect location for that. So uh, I went to some stores and I installed an application that um, whenever it saw a face, it would take a picture and upload it to my server. Um, and uh, once, once per minute. And uh, I got a lot of faces, maybe a few thousand. And I exhibited uh, these. I exhibited these images actually back in the store. After collecting them, I went to the store and I wrote a new app that when I uh, that I installed on all the computers. And then uh, I took out my iPod and I pressed a button, and all the computers showed the exhibition uh, of these <laughs> photos, kind of scrolling like slideshow through each photo. Most people were like, what, "What's going on? Um, <laughs> what did I do?" And then if you hit escape, it, I didn't want to ruin anyone's day, so if you hit escape, it just closes and they can go back to what they were doing, but I thought I would you know, co off the store for a little bit and do an exhibition of these photos, and some people were like, oh, this is really interesting, like, who are these people, like, why, why do they look like that, and started wondering, like, what, and they realized after a little bit, like, oh, these, are at the, these people are at the Apple store, ah, and, yeah, so there was some reflection going on because of the space that it was exhibited in, but, um, Anyway, uh, I'm off the hook now. The Secret Service said, actually, I'm just an artist. And I'm not like an international hacker. So uh, they gave me my computer back. And uh, I'm not going to be like sued by Apple or anything. But yeah. Uh, so we'll, we can talk about like how to do a project like this uh, during the hacking part. OK. Um, maybe we'll go to the next. Yeah. Go and we should actually, actually, we should speed up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, we should we start here? Like, what is... Oh, uh, yeah, go back. Um, with the camera finder? Yeah, uh, can I see? Let's see, so, we've got camera finder, full array, LED hack, cameras. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some different kinds of surveillance. Uh, sometimes uh, you've got cameras in a space and you want to know where they are. Chris found this crazy device that will actually tell you where they are by looking through this uh, lens. And it uses the retroreflective properties of the camera. And I think you said it also uses like Wi-Fi, right? To figure out if there's an IP camera? Uh, yes, this is like an um, RF detector, so it's a signal detector that, um, yeah. Yeah, so you look through the lens and then it lights up where the camera is. That's kind of an inverse or anti-camera surveillance. This is another one that's like anti-camera. <laughs> uh, this is called the image fulgurator. Um, it's 
this device that is built out of a camera and a flash, and in between the flash and the camera, there's this little stencil that he made. Um, here you can see it's projecting a cross onto the podium of Obama. But the thing that's really interesting about this is it's not just a projector. Because it's a flash, it's only for a moment. And inside this, it has a flash detector. So when someone takes a picture, this thing projects with the flash just for a moment. So everyone in that's looking at this doesn't notice anything. They're not like, oh, there's a cross on this podium. But later, when they go and they look at the photo that they took, they're like, why is there a cross on this podium? Um, so it's kind of hacking into other people's cameras by projecting something at exactly the right time. Yeah, and this is not visible. Like, it's just really visible when someone else is taking a picture. Yeah. This is another security camera hack. This is, uh, this may or may not work. There's a lot of, I, my, like, my maker friends are really up in the air about whether this works or not. But the idea was if you put a bunch of IR LEDs on a, on a hat or like a, a band that you're wearing around your head, then you're invisible to security cameras. Um, because normally security cameras operate in IR. Um, so no one else will notice that you're wearing this really bright flashlight, but the security camera won't be able to see your face. Um, some people got really pissed off about this because they were saying, oh, you're, you know, by releasing this information, you're aiding people who want to go rob a bank or something like that. But um, I'm not really sure it actually works anyway. This, this one's a little scarier. This is uh, using IP cameras. So a lot of the time when you get a security camera that's hooked up over the internet, um, it will be uh, broadcasting externally. Like, it'll be broadcasting to the entire internet um, by default. And you have to disable that uh, if you want if you want it disabled. Um, and there's people all over the world that have these cameras and don't realize that it's happening. Um, so I have a friend in Japan who found this out and he started kind of hunting down the addresses of these cameras all around the world. Uh, and a lot of the time, they're higher end cameras that actually have like pan tilt, like robotic control. So he made this photo series that's all about photo stitching these publicly accessible cameras in private spaces. Um, so this is like a lab somewhere in Japan that happened to have one of these cameras and he just typed the IP address into his browser and then made a photo kind of panorama of this, of this space. Um, he has some interesting ones of like people's backyards. <laughs> Yeah, and if, if you're interested in this kind of like anti-counter whatever surveillance, you should read the surveillance article on Wikipedia. It's a good start. I don't think it'll open it. I mean, maybe, yeah. But there's a lot of people doing this kind of research of like documenting yourself, documenting the powers that be instead of vice versa. But maybe we should just move on. Yeah, let's move on. Okay, so... Ah, and actually there's one, one thing, surveillance, surveillance camera players. Oh, but we can't really do the internet right now since there's a lot of people on it. But you should check out these people called the surveillance camera players. They're a theater troupe that performs specifically for people watching surveillance cameras. So like for security guards, they perform for security guards in front of surveillance cameras. Um, and they did a performance of like their interpretation of 1984 in front of some uh, security cameras in the New York City subway. Um, they have a really nice video of that. Um, so we're getting into like observing the city, like when should we start? Maybe we have like, didn't I have like, uh, long exposure. So it's long okay. exposure. Uh, okay, let's start here. Um, Wesley. These, these are some of the longest exposure photographs you'll ever see. I think these were taken over like a year or something like that. It, they had massive neutral density filter in front of it. It was a pinhole, there was a very small aperture, and uh, it was watching a building being constructed over time. I don't know actually where this one was taken. I know the other one was a building. Oh, so I've had some building. Yeah? yeah. Uh -huh, okay. And oh, this is like, we mixed it up. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is in St. Petersburg. This is during the winter in St. Petersburg. Uh, it looks like a long, long exposure, but it's only maybe a second or two. Uh, but it's during the daytime, which is what makes it look so special. And the trick here is just using a neutral density filter, which is just a gray filter over the camera, so that you can take a longer exposure during the daytime. And you get this really interesting portrait of the of the city in motion. You can see like where people are grabbing the rail. You can kind of get a feeling for the direction and the flow of traffic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess this one was that new. But th yeah, you'll, you'll see these stripes at the top in that other image. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, can anyone, anyone guess what those stripes are? 
Sun. Yeah, exactly. It's the sun. So that's the sun over the course of the year, tracing out a new path each day, and every now and then getting blotted out by a cloud. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, okay, and uh, so a couple of studies. Um, this is maybe start with this one. Sort of like ways of like. Um, sort of curating it in a way, like, through, like, time lapse and, like, trying to, like, sort of see what happens at a certain place and sort of, like, reveal, like, behaviors that happen at a certain place. This is, again, like, a, a series by Babak, um, um, trying to look at, like, um, how space creates behavior and, 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 and by, actually, by curating, this is not, like, this is, like, this is, like, really This is all digital, like, retouching. This yeah. is done in Photoshop. He took a bunch of images and combined them together in a way that explains the space in the way he understands it, um, or takes a bunch of coincidences and puts them in the same space. But it's basically like all people like and like doing like the same thing. Everyone lighting a cigarette at the same time. Yeah. Like all the cute girls walking down the street. Everyone leaning on the platform. Everyone running for the subway. This is, there's a few artists who have experimented with this. Who is the? Uh, that's Peter Funge, um, Danish. Guy and they both did that the same same year also and then uh, like I don't know it's like something in the air yeah but <laughs> something yeah <laughs> the white yeah yeah so uh, oh, this is I really like that one actually uh, oh, where were we? there's the one that's like all the people in black this is like all the all the artist people <laughs> you can see there's like the guy with the funny glasses there's the guy with the really low V neck there <laughs> everyone looks depressed in that photo. Um, what else do we have here? Um, oh yeah, and then Richard, yeah. Richard, sort of like we, yeah, like this idea, like taking further, like trying to like understand um, how can you automate that and like take like real video feed and like sort of like reveal. Yeah, um, this is kind of like I don't know. We started like thinking about like how how that could work. It turned out into like other work that's um, that sort of reveals more like. Who is spon who is sponsoring whom in the media lab? But I don't know. Like maybe this can like the interesting bit about this is like real time and like trying trying to do that in real time uh, with like um, video. Uh, this is yeah, that's like, yeah, advanced computer vision techniques for doing the other things we just showed you in an automated way. When did I? I mean, there's one. Maybe don't need to show everything. Oh yeah, Street yeah. Live. Um, the studies in New York from uh, William White. I mean, this is a 60-minute film we can show just like a few examples, but also like similar studies of like public spaces and doing very analog um, studies of like trying to understand over time where people, what are they doing and where they are and, 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 and basically like mapping, mapping behaviors in terms of mostly, mostly just like seating behaviors, but like sort of how trying to understand like, how people use parks and like trying to uh, create patterns and like see these patterns and through um, Super 8 Super 8 camera and like setups usually from the roof. I don't know if it actually shows here, but oh in the beginning This is a good shot. So this is um There's a clock in the, in the bottom. It's very like Gilbreth style uh, very analog and then that basically like um, 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 Setting setting up a brown needs to go on like time lapse to like to like over like yeah, like study in place over 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 the day, and and over a long time actually, really to understand how these spaces are used, and and, and that's why we have like today like um, yeah like Times Square, you can like sit there. <laughs> um, this one, that's something like at some point like we, like Julian Bika and I were like really interested in the idea, and like Julian came with this poll and like basically mounted like two hero cameras on a pole and then this is a the, sort of like William White inspired like observation series like trying to like sort of create this point birds point of view or like it's actually I mean it's just a extension pole but like sort of try to understand understand these patterns and then on this like done like a couple of like computer vision things but the perspective it, itself is already very interesting like thinking of like to Tony Hill like sort of extending like really changing the perspective and then um, 
These are these are okay. Really quickly, this is really fascinating um, stuff. Uh, this is like a, a, an excerpt from a film. LA plays itself, and and it's the same guy who made the film about Woodbridge. Um, uh, Thomas, what's his name? I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But basically, what's going on here is like it's like um, showing for the Bradbury Building, like showing how these narratives can also be fictionally like be like augmented on a, on on maybe on just one singular building, but like on and it's basically like sort of like trying to understand film in a way that um, analyze it in a way like okay like really understanding where where was this location what was shot there and and really having like over time like so many narratives and so many like uses of that building and like until there's so many films shot in that building and at some point also with uh, with Blade Runner they were like okay um, this building has been in so many movies like there's no way you should like shoot that film there but like Ridley Scott basically at some point like disguised it with the atmosphere that it's like it's not really visible I mean you, you, you if you know it then you can see it but it's like yeah it's 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 interesting because um, yeah that's a that's a very analytical way to think like from like what kind of pictures were played there and that page. Um, there is um, there is uh, the film like th that's that's a really um, um, like sort of like inspirational movie for for all of this is like um, Harvey Keitel and Smoke like sort of like having this obsession to like document when one when he's closing the door like taking a picture each evening and it's sort of his project to like uh, to to understand. The neighborhood and then also understand understand really like it's like creating creating this this long 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 history over time and sort of it's pretty simple he's just at some point like when he closes the store he's like taking a picture and a snapshot <laughs> that I like I like looking at this and thinking about it as a really uh, like large scale automated trigger. Like normally you have an intervalometer that's driving your camera like every thirty seconds or something, but this is like one guy who's like twenty four hours, twenty four hours. <laughs> yeah, and so thinking about memory, like one experiment that really I find fascinating is uh, is the work by Pierre Huyck. Yeah. Um, so in '73, I think there was this bank robbery in in in, in, in Brooklyn, and and it became this film in um, Dark Day Afternoon. Um, and and Al Pacino is is is, is, is sort of reenacting that bank robbery a year after it happened, and it's interesting because. It's, like the Pierre who basically at some point when the the, the the actual bank robber got released, like he's he's like um, he invited him to like reenact the bank robbery in like a in in a, in a bit of space that's been built like exactly like after the bank and sort of like show show how how he's been robbing the bank, but like through like multiple like memories that have been built up as stories like through the film and like he also said like the day after they watched Godfather like like the, 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 the both the team actually went to the bank and also used like quotes that were in Godfather and so it's like it's it's a very layered memory this is this is pretty complex but it's I, I think that the thinking behind it is is is, is sort of like it's really fantastic um, I, I think we should go through the rest yeah. of this pretty fast because we don't have much time. Right. Right. Um, but I'm going to kind of power through this since I know how okay. good these ones go. So I uh, uh, really wanted to show you quickly this idea of working with 3D. This is not really about Connect or 3D, but uh, it's very relevant. Um, people are building portable Connects. Uh, they're using them for doing all kinds of analysis in the daylight. Um, it's not just uh, hackers who are working with 3D, but there's a lot of people who are from, kind of from forensics. This is all, none of this is real, if any of you guys have wheezy stomachs. Um, but uh, they're doing analysis like LiDAR, 3D scanning, trying to figure out um, like how, how scenes have uh, 
been constructed, like where does this come from, what's the history of this scene, you know, where was the bullet fire that caused this blood spray. Um, it's the same kind of measurement that we're talking about with Moorbridge and, and Murray. Uh, people are combining, again, this is looking at the subway, um, this is here in New York, combining um, photography with 3D scanning and doing a more artistic, uh, non-problem solving approach to looking at 3D scanning data. Um, there's a whole genre of seeing through things. Uh, where's, our, where's our good? Okay, there we go. So this is, uh, if you have a Sony camera that has a night shot mode and you can run it in daytime, then there's this uh, funny trick, which is that uh, IR tends to see through most um, thinner fabrics, whereas visible light does not penetrate uh, most, visible fa uh, most thin fabrics because otherwise people would not wear it. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, with Nightshot, they disabled that on some of the more recent cameras so that the exposure can only go um, down to a certain level. Um, uh, otherwise, like you wouldn't be able to use it in the daytime and do stuff like this. But um, anyway, we can talk about how this stuff works a little more later. And if you guys want to do that, we can. Um, if we have any volunteers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Photoelasticity, this is a really interesting way of revealing things in a super simple way. I have the tools here for us to do this. If you put um, a polarizing filter in front of a camera and put a polarized light behind it, like a computer screen, you can see all sorts of patterns that you wouldn't normally see in materials. Um, and this will be one of the hacks that we can work on. Um, using Wi-Fi, you can also see through things. You can make a camera out of Wi-Fi routers. These guys made a did a project where they were looking through walls and trying to understand the structure behind things by looking at the Wi-Fi signal propagation. Um, yeah, they they made a massive. Uh, yeah, this is this is what the camera looks like. It's a bunch of Wi-Fi routers that are lined up that are scanning a space like this. So that's pretty pretty awesome. Uh, oh, where's uh, you don't have the gestures? Can you go back to the finder? Okay, awesome. Yeah, I don't know what's happening either. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I tried to open it in the yeah, okay. preview. Wow, it does good. Um, looking around corners, you guys should really check this out if you have a chance. There's this amazing professor at MIT called Ramesh Raskar, uh, and he has a project where he basically uses a trillion frame per second camera, no joke, to uh, watch light as it moves through a material. Um, and he has a trick where you basically look at a door and on the other side of that door uh, is something you can't see. Like the door is, uh, if the door is a mirror, you would be able to see what's in the room. But because it's not a mirror, you can't see what's in the room. However, if you bounce a laser off of that door, uh, even in a diffuse way, um, you can reconstruct what's on the other side of that room by watching the light propagate uh, over time, coming back to the camera. Um, and so you can actually see around walls with that technique. Um, this is like really crazy cutting edge research that we're not doing tonight. Uh, finally, DIY cameras. Uh, I love this wood, wood block print. This is from Hokusai, a Japanese artist, uh, from late 1700s, I think. And um, yeah, there's a pinhole right here in the shoji screen, and there's Mount Fuji upside down right here on the other shoji screen. It's a little camera obscura that happened on accident. And everyone's like, what just happened? <laughs> and this guy's like, dude, it's camera obscura, come on. <laughs> uh, you can make these pretty easily um, with uh, pinholes and uh, film or with vellum. Um, we, have some, we got some vellum for you guys and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and let's see, I think, yeah, that's it. So let's move on to our, onto our challenges. Yeah, yeah, questions, really quickly. To sort of connect those links and stuff? Yeah, yeah to, to get all of those links. Um, we're, we can't uh, throw it up there right now, but after the workshop, we'll put a link on this URL, the sync.in slash camera hacking workshop. We'll put a link to download all the stuff that we just showed, yeah. Um, put it on Dropbox. Yeah, we'll put it, yeah, we'll put it, it'll be posted on Dropbox and we'll put a link to Dropbox on this document. Uh, oh, thanks, Adam, for posting the robot cleaning patterns. Uh, so, were there any other questions about the stuff we were showing? Is there anything where you guys were like, was not following that? 
I, I mean, I guess it's okay if you weren't following that. So uh, let's go on. So the challenge is we've got a bunch of different ideas that we can throw at you guys, and we want to help you make something happen. Our, our idea is to like take the people here, get you guys to work in groups or individually to accomplish something specific within the next hour. We're only running maybe 10 minutes late or something. Uh, yeah, we started a little, like 15 minutes late. Um, and we've got a bunch of materials here on the table, and we've got a bunch of tasks that are like ideas that you guys can try. Um, so let's go over both of them. Uh, challenges first. So Shutter Hack for Polaroid. Chris is like a master of hacking Polaroid cameras to get an external shutter to trigger the camera release. Um, and we have tools. We have uh, screwdrivers, soldering iron, wires, etc. for hacking Polaroids. Did anyone bring Polaroid? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we've got at least one Polaroid. That's great. Um, I don't know what you guys are going to hook it up to. Maybe it'll be something to stamp on. Maybe it'll be some something someone hits their head on. I, I don't know. But I want to see that happen. Uh, we have an idea about 3D camera obscure glasses. Can anybody imagine what that looks like? We just dreamt of this yesterday, but I think it would be really cool. So we got the materials for it, and we want to see if we can make one. The idea is uh, to have. Uh, the, this black box that's in front of your face with two pinholes and then vellum just behind the pinholes. <laughs> and I think it would be awesome because if it's, if it's spaced right, then, then you can see in 3D, but just on the vellum. And I don't know, we'll see if it works. We should try it. So we have all the materials. We have the black foam core, we have some black uh, like card tape, uh, card stock, we have the vellum, uh, we've got the black tape, uh, we've got scissors, everything. Um, uh, hotel observation by telescope. There's a bunch of buildings around here, and we have a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a script. I have a processing script that will uh, uh, take a photo whenever uh, the scene changes. So, like, if someone turns on a light, perfect. We'll take a picture. <laughs> uh, we have to figure out how to hook up someone's webcam. I have a webcam over there. We can hook up to the telescope. Um, Long exposure with processing. I don't have code for that, but I think that would be interesting to write if someone wants to work on that. Um, infrared filter. Uh, most cameras have an IR filter that you can remove. Um, some cameras don't have an IR filter in the first place. Something like a really crappy cell phone probably doesn't have an IR filter on it, and it can see IR. You can test this if you take some kind of remote control and point it at the camera. You'll see a light, and your eyes won't see the light, but the camera will see the light. If you see the light, then there's no IR filter. Um, if, uh, yeah, and if you only have IR coming through, then you can do tricks like seeing through clothes and stuff like that. Um, I have a big panel over there uh, that's, um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's got some paper on it right now, but it looks black to your eyes. It looks completely black. black. If you hold it up to the sun, you can't see anything, but IR can see through it. Um, so that's a good way of getting some IR only images. Uh, 3D Ustream hack. Oh, this is something else. So you saw Kenichi's project where there was two cameras on the sides of this big wooden structure, and then there was someone wearing glasses. Uh, we had an idea, which is just to take two laptops, get them both to stream to Ustream, and then have a third laptop where you have both videos side by side. So we can do like kind of monster vision. Maybe we can do like monster vision of the skyline over here. I think that that takes three people with laptops. Yeah, yeah. We, we basically have two webcams. We set them yeah. up like very spaced, and yeah. we can like we can stream like super yeah. 3D exactly from yeah. Studio X. Yeah, I want to see that. Uh, <laughs> So let's see what else do we have. Ref some, something with the reflective domes. We got these amazing reflective domes from Canal Plastics. They're like five bucks. You should totally, everyone should go buy one. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they're good for, but there's got to be something. I think if you watch the, what's his name again? Hill, t Tim Hill? Oh, Tony Hill. Tony Hill. If you watch the Tony Hill films, he does a bunch of stuff with this. If we have a, we can pull off the projector for a little bit. A really simple experiment is pointing the camera at that, taking video, and then playing it back through the projector onto that, and you'll get a uh, reproduction of the space um, as the, you know, as this saw it. Yeah. Whoa, what's going on? Maybe that's too close because it has to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's an idea. Uh, let's see. Something, uh, well, the camera, sorry, I just got blinded by the projector. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Multi-camera with lots of separation, super 3D. Oh yeah, that's kind of, so as you, as you get cameras further apart and you're doing 3D stereo viewing, then, yeah. Yeah, we can so do it with this one. Yeah, we can do it with two webcams instead of with two computers. And there's also a drill, and there's some like I mean, like cameras have like a mount, like the standard mount is like quarter inch, so you can I got some screws to just like. Yeah, so we have screws for mounting whatever cameras we might have with yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, oh, what's what's, what's next? Uh, movement detection, light change. So I, I wrote some processing code uh, that you guys can work with. Um, I'll post the link in just a second, um, and we have a few different demos there. I wrote them for different kind of triggering. Uh, who's worked with processing before? Anybody? Oh, this is awesome. Okay, so uh, one of them is a sketch that will manually trigger. So like if you hit something on your keyboard or if you click your mouse, then it will trigger. A really simple hack for controlling your computer is to take an old mouse, tear it apart, and get the cursor on top of your applet, <laughs> and then whenever you hit the mouse button on this torn apart mouse, then something happens. So that's a really easy way of creating an external trigger for uh, capturing photos. So I have an app that does external triggering, I have an app that does timed triggering, and uh, shows you how to just do an interval, interval longer. Um, another one that does brightness change or movement uh, triggering, um, and another one that shows you how to remotely upload something, like if you wanted to do a project at the Apple Store. Um, it's still open, maybe, until, you know, maybe it's too little to there, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't say anything about that. Uh, you didn't hear that from me. Um, but actually, I found out today I'm not kicked out because I went and I got a new computer case, and I was like, have you heard my name before? After they saw my credit card, I was like, have you heard my name before? And he was like, no, why? And I said, oh, okay, good. And I started leaving. And, and he said, no, but should I? Like, why should I? Uh, look, at, look at my website. Look at my website. And I just really left out of the store really quickly. So, but yeah, I guess I'm not banned. So that's good. Uh, movement detection, light change. We already did the 360 near infrared. Oh, oh, these are just repetitions. Okay. Near infrared, or we have in there? Near infrared. Yeah. Mean. And what other tools do we have here on the table? Oh, and I've got the polarized, we forgot to add polarized filter. There's that crazy stuff that, uh, that you can see if you put the polarized filter in front, of your, in front of your screen. I don't know what to do with that, but there's got to be something to do. So I have some filters over there for, for polarization. Um, yeah, so at this point what I want to happen is uh, if you see an idea here that you're excited about, or if you have your own idea, uh, I want to like form some groups so that people can accomplish these things and then after an hour we're going to get back together for just a few minutes and uh, yeah if we have some if we have a little time then we can say here's what we did but probably what will happen is we'll just post some information to this URL about what we did and then we can collect it afterwards and do a report back to you guys like tomorrow or something um, yeah so how should we how should we organize these groups do we we just want to like. What's the right yeah. number of people to be in a group? I, I don't know. I think it depends on the like. If you're doing the the uStream thing, you need three people. Um, maybe we should say like, who, raise your hand if you want to do this one. Right, How about okay. that? I have a question. Yeah. How are we going to be able to see three people? Do you have like a heads up display or a yeah? So that's 3D some, glasses. Right. Or? Normally, the way that it works is you have 3D glasses. We don't we don't have any 3D glasses or not 3D glasses. Normally, you have like head-mounted display. Uh, we don't have one, um, so we have to rely on uh, either doing. Um, we can make a cardboard thing on the screen and like just place the two images. Yeah, so that's and something we can yeah. make a simple three D thing. Right. Yeah. You can just stare across. It. Yeah. No, I, no, no. But like you just make a device, and then you have like you make like it's not very high res, but it's gonna be okay to see it. Yeah. So we're gonna have to yeah. hack with that. If you can't do parallel viewing, then I'm not sure that we'll be able to do much there. Um, parallel or cross eyed viewing. But yeah, let's let's do the list again and we can say if you want to do this, raise your hand and then people can get together. So, uh, so who wants to hack the Polaroid? You gonna hack the Polaroid? Yeah? Alright. She has the Polaroid. You ready for her to hack your Polaroid? <laughs> okay, we'll talk to her about it. Um, <laughs> it's totally fine to be in a group of one, so feel free, but you have to get her permission. <laughs> um, 3D camera obscura glasses. Who wants to get busy on building some camera obscura glasses? That's a good challenge. Yeah. One, two. Okay. Look at, look at each other. Keep your hands up. Look at each other. All right. You guys know who we are. 
Okay, good. We had like a first sketch, like, but it's gonna be completely different. But yeah, it's really it, a challenge, like, it's really a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's a very it special. Work, I've never seen that device before. Yeah, I've done a lot of weird Do you want to do like, those here because the sketch yeah. is already? Yeah, if you're if you're yeah. doing the that, then come over like, here. Right. Okay, to this right. one. And if you're using uh, soldering iron or some other hard tools, use that one. But this one is good for cutting. That one's good for soldering. Uh, okay, uh, telescope. Who wants to close the telescope? <laughs> okay, awesome. We've got a telescope over here. Yeah. Okay, next one. Uh, does anybody want to do the long exposure? I can, like I said, the code doesn't exist. All right, I'll talk. Let's talk. Okay. Um, 3D with Ustream. Who wants to do crazy Ustream hacking? Okay, all right, you're on it. You're going to be, yeah. And, and maybe collaborate with the team that does like, <laughs> old, like the rig, like a yeah. super 3D rig. Yeah. So, and then. Yeah, but we'll see if we, let's see, so what's next? Uh, so who wants to go with reflective domes? Anybody have reflective domes and projector? Yeah, awesome. This is great. I like that everyone's like, ah, this one, this one, this one. This is what I was hoping for. Yeah. A multi camera on the side. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, any other kind of super 3D? Yeah? Okay. So maybe also you guys work together. Great. Um, we have two webcams we can do that with. I have one webcam. Over it, I, it's, I best if they're, it's best if they're matched. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But it's fine. Mm. Uh, playing with infrared. Anyone wants to play with infrared? And we don't have any volunteers for. <laughs> okay. No one wants to admit to the one <laughs> Okay, are, am I forgetting anybody or any projects? Raise your hand. We're going to do the long exposure. Oh, okay, great. Okay, and if you have other ideas, uh, come talk to me. And I, I'm going to be kind of a free agent. I'll go around and try and help people out with whatever they're having issues with. And I'll put up on uh, the screen right now. If you want to use processing, I'll give you the download. Anything? But yeah, let's, yeah, let's just go ahead and break up. Let's the go. And uh, yeah, just knock it out of the park. So just talk to me about like material you need or like things. Well, it's actually basically like here on the table, right? so like feel free. Yeah. 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 Yeah.